All right, here we are, another episode of Let There Be Talk, and we have a legendary drummer here. You know this podcast has had more drummers than any podcast on the planet in the last 12 years, and today I am sitting down with the man here, Mr. Chris Slade. How are you, buddy? Hi, I'm good. Thanks, Lynn. Man, so good to have you, bud. Yeah, it's nice to be here. It really is. I just I just want to blast some of your credits real quick for people that might just know you from ACDC or the firm. Uh, here we go. Manfred Man Band, uh, Earth Band, Tom Jones, yeah. Gilmore, David, Mo uh, Gary Moore, Gary Newman, Olivia Newton-John, Asia, Mick Ralphs. Uh, it, it goes on and on and on. It is unbelievable your career as a drummer. Yeah, I'm very proud of that and uh, very pleased, too, to be working, you know, because uh, that was my criteria when I started. Uh, I wanted to be a drummer for however long I possibly could. I haven't done it for my whole life yet, thank God, but um, <laughs> I'm working on it. I That's... don't think I need these. I don't think I need these cans, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's an interesting story here. Um, you know, saying you wanted to play drums, you know, the entire, your entire career, basically in and out of bands. Did you start in a band like people do with like some guys in the neighborhood? Like, all right, uh, this is our band. Uh, We're going to get a record yeah. deal. Local youth club. Um, didn't last very long, but, uh, yeah, you you have to do that. You can't go straight into a professional job, you know. And but I always practiced a lot. I used to practice two or three hours, certainly two uh, after school before my parents came home. Um, and uh, that's what I didn't practice after that. <laughs> but uh, as as people would say, oh yeah, I can tell that. Um. You know, but um, yeah, I and I tried out new things, like newfangled things, like paradiddles. Oh yeah, which is a rudiment, you know. I'm sure you know. Absolutely. Um, um, which have been around forever, you know, ever since the drum was a a battlefield instrument. I'm sure. Now, so, because that's where they started, you know. Of course, I'm sure you know that too. When you started out, was it drums or did you want to play guitar or bass or was it always just drums? Uh, it was drums. Um, I think the drums uh, adopt you, not the other way around. And people have said that. I'm not the only one. And I think that's true, actually. Um, I always wanted to be a stand-up comic, though. People just laughed at me. <laughs> Is that right? You were you wanted to be a stand-up comic? No, I just thought I'd throw that in. That's my favorite Woody Allen joke. That. <laughs> that, that that's what I do. I'm a stand-up comic. Yeah, I read your um I saw your website. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me but, let me ask uh, you. In the early days, who were your guys? What got you onto the kit? Uh you know, I oh, my brother, my elder brother was uh, a marching drummer, you know, uh, in a marching band <clears throat> um, when he was, uh, and he's eight years older than me, um, when he was in school, so to speak. And he used to bring his big side drum, which is probably about two foot deep, uh, covered in brass. He used to bring it home on weekends to clean. And of course, who cleaned it? <laughs> yeah. I'll get my younger brother on it, you know. So. Um, and for me doing that, he taught me a few drum licks. So uh, he started me off. So if people don't like the way I play, play my brother. <laughs> Does he still play drums? No, he doesn't. Um, he stopped when he was a teenager. Um, and, you know, he worked in a factory most of his life. Wow. He was very ill at one point, but after that, 
uh, he worked in a factory. So uh, and my father was a tap dancer singer who also worked in a factory by day and was Superman by night, you know, tap dancing and singing. Um, so, you know, showbiz has sort of been my blood, if you like, if you, you know, in a semi-pro way. And I turned professional in 1963 when I was 16 years old. And that was with Tom Jones before he was called Tom Jones. Wow. He was and Tommy Scott. What about that guy's voice? It is unreal. Just, uh, I always say, and I'm sure it's true, it's the best untrained natural voice ever born, to be honest. That's my take on it. And I know him very well. And I've heard his voice under all sorts of circumstances and, you know, tremendous voice. Even today, he's he's lost his top end, but that's naturally, he's 88 years old, you know, or right. 80, 80 something, 85, 80, I don't, I'm not quite sure. Same age as my brother. Um, so, uh, and they went to school together, but I didn't meet Tom before that. I'd never met him when I went for, when they came to me for the audition. Wow. Well, and how long does that last? What, Tom? Yep. Uh, seven years. Wow. 63 to 70. Wow. And then I joined um, uh, Mantra Band's Earth Band. Um, but with Tom, it taught me a hell of a lot. Um, I learned, I really learned my trade there, my professional trade. I could play drums pretty good, but you know, there are certain things you've got to do and you, you got to, you know, got to learn. And it taught me about the music business, taught me all sorts of stuff. Um, and I, I, you know, we toured with Tom with, uh, the Count Basie Orchestra. Oh, Wow. And I uh, I got to play a couple of songs uh, every night with the Count Basie Orchestra. I think Harold Jones was the drummer then. Um, it was Count Basie's drummer. and uh, uh, But he got off his drums, I got on mine, and I played like two songs before Tom came on. Two, two numbers with the Count Basie Orchestra, which was a real thrill because uh, I started with jazz um, because there were no listening to the radio, which is all we could do in those days, apart from 78 wax discs, you know, um, which my brother had. There were no um, pop drummers around, if you like, because they were called, we were called pop musicians then, or, and then we became beat musicians. Um, bands weren't in the uh, equation yet. We we were pop groups uh, in the sixties, and uh, you know, with, uh, with so I listened to jazz because there were great drummers listening to jazz. So any sort of uh, jazz program, I didn't have television until I was about eleven, twelve years old. And internet, what's that? You know, <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> this was the nineteen fifties. You know, uh, internet was about fifty years away at least. Um, so uh, you know, it was very difficult to hear good performances by drummers. So you had to learn your trade, of course, by listening to other drummers. That's how you learn. Um, and the only thing we had was the radio and uh which was not very good and uh nothing much else actually so anyway i got into buddy rich and gene krupa and drummers like that uh as many people did ringo Starr, cozy powell many people of my generation um and that's how I learned my craft. So I started that before, you know, that's how I was learning drums. Um, 
and I was trying to keep current as well to a certain extent because I knew if I got in a band, I'd have to play whatever was current, whatever was popular. Um, so I kept up with that as well, along with the jazz type drumming. I couldn't say I was a jazz drummer, but I could because I played with Count Basie. So, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so it's uh, you know that was my learning place um and i started off uh, when i was a kid a real kid um with two knives on a biscuit box <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah bop, 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 bop. <laughs> and it was a great spring on that you know <laughs> you've probably done it yourself uh the the knives are really you get a nice spring off those sort of things yeah Speaking of jazz, uh, did you ever see a Frank Sinatra movie, Man with the Golden Arm? I th I think I did. He got into drugs in it, didn't he? Yeah. The character. Yeah. He's yeah. a jazz drummer with a heroin addiction. It's a great film. Right. I wish I I wish I could bring it to mind. I I probably haven't seen it, in actual fact. I saw a film called uh it was called All Night Long, and somebody uh, Patrick McGowan was the actor. He played uh, a jazz drummer. And I bought that uh, soundtrack. And I used to listen to that all the time. And the funny thing was, uh, some of the drummers on that, I um, I got to know. Uh, a guy called Barry Morgan was in it. He, was, um, he played like a Latin percussionist. And he was a great drummer also. He played Latin and... Uh, great rock drummer. He played on uh, some of Tom's stuff, um, and I got to know him. So it's funny. I see a movie when I'm a kid, buy the soundtrack, and then I I meet that guy. Uh, years later, a couple of years later, I'm not yeah. that long, sixties. Uh so that's um, fate for you, or whatever you like to call it. Let's get into this. I uh, saw you March 15th, 1985, Oakland Arena. Uh, my mom's birthday, rest in peace. Uh, the Firm. It's the first time I really know who you are because at the time I was a Zeppelin freak. Didn't get to see Zeppelin because I was just a little too young. But I go to the Oakland Arena and I see The Firm and I got to say, it was one of the greatest shows I ever saw. And not only was uh, the, the live show amazing, but there was something that stuck with me my entire life. And it was the simplicity of the stage with those mirrors above. Remember that? Ah. Yeah. Remember that? Uh, that, was, uh, that was my invention. I oh. wanted mirrors. <laughs> Honestly. It was crazy because your drum solo, while you're playing, these mirrors would tilt and you could see what you were doing. Yeah, that was my whole idea, honest, honestly. I'm not just, I'm not pretending here. Um, I said I want some mirrors up above me. Uh, of course, it was the precursor of video behind the stage. And that hadn't been invented yet, you know? Right. Um, I, I just thought it was interesting for people to see a drum kit from that angle. And uh, they had to find the right angle for it. But once they did, they just pulled it on chains to get the uh, the mirror up. And, and that was it. So I'm pleased you remember that. Wow, that's... Oh, dude, <laughs> that's let me real... tell you something. I never forgot it. Because I was sitting there and I was like, wow. Because they came down and they would tilt. And you'd be just be like, oh, this is amazing. Look at this, you know? <laughs> Well, I'm so glad my idea paid off, honestly. Yeah. Um, nobody's ever said that before. Oh, man. They, well, have said, they have said, they've come up to me, you know, even last weekend uh, with firm albums for me to sign. And they say, this is my favorite album of all time. They, uh, and it's not like Led Zeppelin or anything like that. It's the firm. And I'm I'm still shocked by that when they come up and say that, and I look at them a bit quizzically, and I'm like, oh, uh -huh. yeah. And because uh, my my favorite is Led Zeppelin, you know, would be, or you know, or, or Pink Floyd or something like that, you know. Yeah. But 
uh, I'm so glad that people do do that. And they're genuine, you know, and there's, they've got hundreds of records and this firm record is their favorite one. Nobody else comes up and says, oh, this is my favorite record from Man For Man's Earth Band or, uh, you know, my favorite from Tom Jones or anything like that. It's always yeah. the firm. So that is a big ego boost, if you like. Let me ask you this. So, you know, Jimmy, of course, Bonzo dies and he passes away. Jimmy kind of disappears for a little bit. You're out um, playing with Gilmore, who is uh, I've recently uh, considered my favorite guitar player of all time, you know, and, and, and it took a long time for me to grasp that you know like wait a minute but i had phil susan on and he said that oh i know phil yeah, yeah right so he was getting together with jimmy uh early firm and then i don't know what happened he ends up not uh playing with the group and then it's uh tony of course but at what point do you get contacted because i know jimmy was waiting for you to get off this david gilmore tour how does yep. he come in um come in to play with you? How does he find out about you? Does he see you with Gilmore? What's going on? Um I don't know how you have to ask him that, but uh I think somebody sort of recommended me or said, you know, you should have a look at this guy or something like that. Um and I I just got off this is the same day. I just got off the phone to David Gilmore and uh, we arranged, uh, you know, we, I'd be playing drums with him for about three months, which extended and extended. But um, so then I said to my missus, uh, okay, let's go on the pub. I'm going on the road with David Gilmore, which I'd met Dave before and he was a great guy. And as you just said, just tremendous guitarists. Uh, guitarist and uh, and he was uh, I knew it was him you know almost immediately except I thought it was somebody winding me up at first yeah um, and uh, it's like oh he left her okay so go down the pub and have lunch okay go down the pub have lunch come back to the flat the apartment ring ring pick it up oh, how's Jimmy Page here yeah? I, I I looked at the phone like, what the hell? Wow. And I said, come on, Fred, I know it's you. <laughs> no, 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 it really is Jimmy Page. You know, I thought it was my friend winding me up, you know. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> as me and uh, me and Paul Rogers are putting a band together and we'd like you to play drums. Well, Jim, I... I I can't believe this because an hour and a half ago, uh, I accepted a, a tour with David Gilmore. And he said, and I, uh, dead silence on the other end. Oh, that's all right. We'll wait. Wow. And it's like, again, take phone away from head, look at phone, put back on head. And... Uh, they did wait for a, a, probably about a year in the end because yeah. the tour was 10 months long. And it kept getting extended. And I kept saying to, I used, I kept calling Jim then and say, um, oh, I'm sorry, mate, it's been extended for another two months. And that happened about three or four times, something like that. And he said, oh, don't worry. We, we're okay. We just... Uh, we're just trying things out here. So this is, I, I suppose, when Phil Suzanne, I knew that Phil had done things with with uh, Pagey because he, he told me, he told me many times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's amazing. Uh, we, what's crazy is you're in Manford Man, and then here you are in Gilmore after, which is, you know, Pink Floyd, one of the biggest bands ever. And then into Jimmy after that, Zeppelin, the all-time greatest with the best drummer of all time. Like, how is your name getting in the hat? Because 
in Man for Men, it's not like you're like this crazy rock drummer, you know? So what are they seeing or hearing? Um, I have no idea. You have to ask them. But, you know, I can play a bit. Oh, yeah, and, of course. Uh, of course. I, keep, I keep time really well. Ah, oh, I know Gilmore saw me work with Mick Ralphs. Oh, yeah. He saw me with the Mick Ralphs band. I remember that now. Um, we didn't do many gigs, just a few pub gigs, just to try the band out. And uh, I said, oh, Dave, you know, um, I'd love to, but, you, you know, I'm I'm uh, working with Mick Ralphs and his band. He said, that's all right, Mick's doing it too. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Now, here's a crazy thing. Jimmy waits for you, but not once had he played with you yet, which is really wild. No. Man. Um, and you know, often, you know, that's not that strange, actually, uh, because you can always sack that guy after you've tried him out. You know? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's different. With ACDC, I auditioned along with a hundred other drummers. Um, so they, uh, you know, uh, it's not always as easy as Paigey ringing me up going, hey, do you want to be a bi band? Let me think for a minute. Yes, yeah. Jim, yes. Yeah. Now, when you finally get home, you go down and do you rehearse with them? Like first, like here's what we've got. And you're working up tunes for that first record, like radioactive and stuff. Um, you're in there. And what's that like? Cause you know, we're coming off of Jimmy from 80 and then the arms festival and stuff. Jimmy is pretty torn yep. up on drugs at the time, but by the time he gets to the firm, it looks like he might be cleaned <laughs> up by then. And, uh, yeah, and, and really ready to go. Drinking spritzers. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Um and he he's you know, he was a nice guy. He really was. Just an ordinary guy who happened to be a rock god, you know. A rock god. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Hey rock god, uh do you want fish and chips or chicken and chips? <laughs> <laughs> when uh, you, got you can't you can't go around on eggshells. Because you're working with stars, no way. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, you, you, just, they're just ordinary guys like everybody else. I, my saying is, people are people. Yeah. And uh, so I try to accept or keep an open mind about everybody, and uh, it's worked for me so far. You know. Uh, so they, yes, they had some ideas, and we worked them up in the studio. Unlike ACDC, who had um, demos of everything, and you played the demo almost exactly like the demo. And that's always been the same with them, because um, Angus and Malcolm uh, played drums. Uh, and Angus still plays drums, of course, and uh, he's I'm sure he's still demoing. Um, so... Uh, you know, it, it's uh, different bands have different ways. Um, like we used to, with ACDC, we'd play with everyone in the studio at the same time, but screened off, of course. Of course. So the sounds, the sounds don't bleed or anything. Um, so uh, that's how I did the timeline thing. We all played in the studio all at the same time. Um, they already knew the songs because of the demos that I had done this time. And they put their individual individual take on it, timeline now, I mean. Yeah. Um, so, you know, everybody works in a different way. Some people just work on their own. Um, I prefer to work in a band environment. To me, it's uh, it's home to be honest. And uh, that's why we travel now with uh, in a van, all of us together. We don't fly places. Uh, we're going to Italy in a couple of weeks, and it's a long way to drive, man. Wow. Uh, it's like driving, you know, the, the depth of USA, something like that. Yeah. Um, 
it's a long, long way. Uh, so we're going to take like, uh, we've got to take about five days to go there and come back. Wow. Because, um, uh, you know, a couple of drivers, but um, it's still tough. So anyway, I digress. Um, yeah, everybody, uh, with Gilmore, the the work was already done. Uh, he'd done his uh, About Face album. Um, and we all sort of copied that or, or did the best we could with that, so to speak. Um, and, uh, of course, we did the Pink Floyd things, which which Insane. we mostly knew anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Com comfortably numb and uh, run like hell and uh, all points in between. And uh, we used to do that every night. Um, and it was an amazing experience to work. Yeah. As I said, David is a, he's a real gentleman. He's a, he's a great guy. Uh, he's generous with his time and his money. And I don't mean to the musicians, which he, which he is, of course, but um, he had a house in London, which he sold for like two million pounds. Wow. And he gave it all to the homeless. Wow. So uh, it's well documented. Yeah. But um, I thought I'd mention that. If people get the wrong idea about Gilmore, he's, you know, and people say to me, oh, you know, Pink Floyd got lucky. No I way. say, no, they didn't get lucky. They no got way. Gilmore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. That is so true, man. That guy's a freak of nature. Singer, yeah. his tone, his plane, his feel. And even back then, his look with just that cool, long, straight, blonde hair. And just like, you know, when they're playing uh you know, those early gigs, it's just crushing it on the black strat. It's unreal to see that guy. Oh, yeah, it is. And, you know, he's an ordinary guy also. He likes a beer. Yeah. Um, You know? Yeah. And he's an ordinary guy, like I said about Jimmy Page. They're people. Yep. And uh, to treat him any different is it's not on. You don't do that, and you can't be for years in the band like I was with. I was a year with Gilmore and two years with Jimmy Page and Paul Rogers with the firm. So uh, you can't walk around going, you know, oh, my God, uh, can I talk to Jimmy Page? I don't know. <gasps> okay. You know, it's uh, he's another musician like you are. And, uh, you know, slightly more of a rock god than I am, but nevertheless... Yeah. Uh, a guy. Well, you're there for a reason. He chose you. So it's like, there it is. You know, it's not like, you know, you always, you have to fit in or you're going to be bounced. If you're sitting there yep. starstruck, they're going to be like, this guy's a weirdo. Get him out of here. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Let yeah. You're you. right. That's what I said. They can, you can always get sacked straight away, go in one day and, well, goodbye then. Uh, we'll try somebody else now. Yeah. Um, and it often happens, I'm sure. What if was you've the... got a pain in the ass, if that's going to happen. What was the end of the firm? Was it the uh, album, the second album, not having the success of the first album? What What happened there? Again, I, I have no idea. Uh, we were getting on well. Uh, Tony and I were really good friends. Um. And I don't think Jimmy and Paul were really good friends. <laughs> right, um, right. Uh, that's my take on it. I don't know because, you know, th those decisions are made without uh, me and Tony Franklin. Of course. Um, because they're made with, uh, you know, with Jimmy and Paul. So right. uh, we're not in on those. And the manager, of course. Yeah. Um, we're not in on those at all so was we, peter we, grant the manager of the firm talk. no it was um phil um oh, yeah me in memory yeah i get phil, it phil thingy he signed he was the one that signed acdc to um to the american record label what um, atlanta Phil, jeez i can't think of his name he manages foreigner now 
oh, at the wow. moment. Yeah. Amongst amongst others. So, I, I can't think of his second name. It'll come to me. <laughs> so was there like fighting towards the end of the tour with between those two guys? No, no, never came to anything like that. Right. Um it just I don't know, it just, just ran its course. Yes. I think that's the truth. It's a shame because I thought there would be at least one more, you know, three. I thought what Paul did with the title of the second one, the title was Mean Business. And I thought that was great because, you know, it can mean so many things. It's a mean business. Yeah. You know, we mean business. Yeah. Uh, all that stuff. And... Uh, the press didn't like it too much. No. Their take on it was, uh, you know, oh, they're doing it for the money. Oh, yeah. Do you think Jimmy Page needs money? Yeah, you're insane. You're insane. The guy <laughs> produced, wrote, and uh, arranged and toured the biggest records of the 70s. You know, it's like, get out of here. He had Peter Grant. Who the got biggest every records of all, all time, time yeah. possibly. And Peter Grant uh -huh. got every nickel, so they didn't need any fucking money. <laughs> and it's an interesting thing about Jimmy, because when you think about Jimmy, Zeppelin, the firm, other than those two, he re and, and, you know, Outrider is this uh, solo record, but it has been very rare that this guy plays. He did the Black Crows uh, tour, but after that, Really, I think he's only played live. He did the O2 Arena, the Zeppelin reunion for Amit Atlantic Records. Yeah. But other I than that, there. yeah, other than that, he's been on stage maybe a handful of times in 20 years. And it's yep. it's a mind boggler to me because you're just like, oh my God, I wish we could have just seen him one more time, like the firm again. If 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 Plant doesn't want to do Zeppelin, you know. And, you know, after the O2, they auditioned singers and then they they didn't do that. So it's really wild. His back his back end of his 20 years of his career, because he's my favorite of all time, you know, as far as a, a super a superman, you know. Yeah. Um, and many other people, too. You're not the only one, as you know. Yeah. Um, he is. He's great. But there's no um, airs and graces. Written. There's no. There's no rock star itis, shall I say? Yeah. Um, he's a guy who, who happens to play guitar quite well. <laughs> yeah. So and... after the, after the firm, it sizzles out. You end up cozy pal passes away, and you end up playing with Gary Moore, another guitar god. And uh, yeah. and, and you know cozy pal first, by the way. One of the greatest of all time, you know? Yeah, he was, he was great. And he was a very nice guy, you know, extremely nice guy. I played poker with him once. Yeah. Uh, and I won. Oh, oh. <laughs> and I was with, with uh, Mick Ralph's as well, I remember, at Mick Ralph's house. Um, that just came to me then. Um, Cozy didn't pass away. He left Gary Moore. Before oh, gotcha. he passed away. Right, right. And, uh, you know, they they called me and said, Gary wants you, like, tomorrow morning at 10 at whatever studio, I can't remember. Um, and I knew Gary before, and we'd had uh, pints together uh, with our wives, in fact. And he seemed a very, very nice guy. He was a very, very nice guy. Um, and then I went to work with him, and uh, he really wanted uh, things exactly the way he wanted, you know. There right. was no room for any spontaneity, which is which is why I think Cozy left, actually. Although Cozy played on the record, he wanted Cozy to play exactly like he played on the record. And Cozy don't do that. You know? Right, 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 right. So it was down it was down to me to learn Cozy's parts in four days. I was on a plane 
five days after I walked into that rehearsal studio um, to, wow. to do the tour. And that's one of the hardest things I've ever done because he wanted hi-hat chips, you know, tsh. he wanted them and exactly like that wherever they turned up, which Cozy had done. So I, I don't think Cozy liked the thought of copying himself, you know, and just playing that because, you know, he, he's a bit like me. He likes to, uh, a bit of freedom with your right. playing. Even if it sounds the same to um, the audience, it won't to cause Cozy if he just puts an odd bass drum beat in here or there or something. Right. But Gary didn't want the odd bass drum beat in here or there somewhere. He wanted a he, drum machine. Uh, yeah, he wanted a drum machine. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And Cozy wouldn't do that. Whereas Muggins here did that. <laughs> <laughs> and now, then to half halfway through, I got fed up with doing that and thought, well, I'll just put the odd kick in here. You know? Yeah. And uh, he didn't say anything. So uh, I guess it was all right. Yeah, yeah. But now, now this is on this tour is where Malcolm sees you the first time. Yes, it was uh, one of the last dates of the Gary Moore tour, I think, in Northern England. And uh, Bob Daisy was the bass player. Oh. Uh, and, and he's Australian. Yeah. And uh, all he said to me, honestly, all he said to me was, oh, Slade, uh, this is Mal. Oh, hi, Mal. Um, I didn't know who Mal was. Yeah. Didn't have a clue. He wow. didn't say, Mal, he's a guitarist, or Mal, he's in ACDC, or none of that. Uh, Slade, this is Mal. Oh, hi, Mal. And we got on like a house on fire. He wasn't drinking at that time, and I think I'd just come off stage. So I probably hadn't had any beer either, because I don't drink before I play. Yeah. Um. Because I can't. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Malcolm, I, I'm pretty sure, was teetotal at that point because he knew he had to be because he was a serious drinker before that. Totally. Um, I've read the, all the books and things too. So uh, yeah, I know it. And I'd heard stories also. And that caused uh, a lot of ructions with Angus and Mal at uh, many points. And... Uh, when they were younger, they used to fist fight, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and that's well documented as well. I'm not telling you anything out of, uh, but that's brothers for you also. Of course. So yeah. you get the call to audition and you said there was a, like a hundred drummers. Do you know who else was in there? Did they give you any word on that? I I do, and I'm not going to say. Oh, you know, it's <laughs> because... Fucking... Yeah, because... <laughs> Because people would call up and say, hey, man, don't tell my band, but I really want to try out with you guys. And it's people you wouldn't dream of. They're in top bands. They're still in top bands, some of them. And, uh, you know, they really wanted to be in, AC, or at least play with ACDC. Um, and they were really, they, they were in really big bands, really big bands. Wow. Some of them. And some of them were the top session men around in the world. And uh, I did the audition. Uh, I found about the 100 drummers afterwards. Uh, Dick Jones told me, the drum tech. He's another Welshman like me. And um, uh, I, I didn't think I did very well. Oh, and they... They sat 10 feet from my kick drum. Wow. Uh, looking at me. Okay. Uh, back in black now. Um, you count in, Slade. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. Click, 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 click. Gang. Gang. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's yeah. what it was like. No, pr no pressure at all, of course. You know? But, of course, they had to do that in order to see if you're going to crack up or not. Because you can't get on stage and freeze, you know. 
and they were playing things like the uh it wasn't stadiums yet which happened on the rock or bus tour when i went back with them but um uh, you know, there were big venues and some big festivals and like Donington, live at Donington. Um, and they want to be sure that you're not going to crack up, you know. And I've been playing, like I played Madison Square Gardens uh, with Tom Jones and the Count Basie Orchestra when I was 19. Yeah, yeah. So I was, uh, for a week, so you know, a I'm week. not. Uh, yes, a week. Um, and you know, it was like, uh, if, uh, if to me, you, it's got to be another day at the office. That's the only way. Because yeah. if you start thinking there's eighty thousand people out there looking at me, of course. you're going to freeze. You know, so you just go out and you do your gig, and you concentrate on the drums. You can, you know, you can look around and everything and see what's going on. Um, but it's, uh, you know, you have to do that. Otherwise, you're going to lose it completely. At and, what point, uh, you know, at, yeah. after the audition, when do they call and say you got it? Well, I didn't think I'd done very well. Really, I didn't. Um, so... I packed my drums up, got me after the audition. It was about an hour or so, hour and a half or so. And I didn't think I'd done well at all. Uh, but anyway, uh, we let you know, Chris. Okay. Thanks, guys. Nice to meet you. Off we go. Got in my car, started to drive home. It was an hour from my house. Right. And I got lost. Oh. Because I was so busy kicking myself, going, why did you do that? Why did you say that? You know, why didn't you do that? Why didn't you do say that? And uh, so I thought, oh, I'm, I'm a bit lost. Uh, an hour from my house. Wow. And uh, phoned the missus, said, uh, I'll, uh, sorry, uh, I got lost. Uh, she said, of course, straight away, how'd you do? I said, uh, not very well. I don't think it went very well at all. I'll tell you all about it when I'm when I'm back. So uh, finally got home, parked the car up. She walked up the path towards me, and uh, she said, "Oh, so you didn't do well, did you?" I said, "No, it wasn't really good." She said, "They just called to say you got the gig." <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. And of course, no mobile phones in those days. No, no. So you had to call the house, you know. Yeah. Your home number. Yeah. So they called before I got home, even. Wow. <laughs> wow. Now, you get the gig. I always like to talk to people about this because here's a giant band. You're getting ready to join. They say you got the gig. But then, of course, the business side comes in. Does management call you and go, this is the money? This is what we're doing. We're doing a record and a tour. Is that what happens And uh, right after they say you got the gig? Yes. That's exactly how it goes. And you discuss that and say, well, I want treble. And they go, you're going to get half. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to get half. And once you strike the deal, you go right in and start recording a record? Yep. Uh, you know, a lot of these guys, money doesn't mean a lot to them. You know, don't get me wrong. We all like money. Yeah. Uh, but it's not their end all and be all. You know, it's uh, the music is the biggest thing with Pagey, with Gilmore, with Manfred Mann, with anybody. Music is the motivating factor. So uh, all those incidentals like money or hotels or stuff like that. It's like, because, okay, you're going to get a hotel. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I have slept in the street, but it'd be nice to have a hotel room. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> exactly. So, I hear you. I hear you. Because, you you know, yeah. you go like, oh, ACDC. Yeah, I'll do it. And then a day goes by and you go, 
wait, I wonder, I wonder what the money is. I wonder how long, what are we doing? You know, then you start sitting down and thinking about stuff. Yeah. Well, I, you know, when they said you've got the gig, they said, but you can't tell anybody, right. not anybody. Yeah. No, nobody. I couldn't tell my kids. I couldn't tell my brother. Yeah. I couldn't tell friends who were drummers who were big ACDC fans. Um, and then this went on f the, till, you know, for three, about three months. Um, Cause the guys uh, had personal things to do. Yeah. Um, and so this went on and on. I couldn't tell anybody. Yeah. Well, they, that's, the, they, that's the biggest. The crazy manager thing. said, you mustn't tell anybody, not yeah. anybody. And I mean that, you know, like, uh, a peril of your life, so to speak, but not quite. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you mustn't mention it. And if I know if I told one of my friends, it would have got out, you know. Of so course. I couldn't. And uh, some of them got really biffed by that. When did you know about this? Oh, about three months ago. And I couldn't say anything. Oh, right. Didn't yeah. speak to me again, ever. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh. Well, the, well. the mystique of ACDC is something that is completely mind boggling to me uh, from, you know, I've signed some NDAs with them before and um, you know, it's, it's really wild to think about because even up until the last tour, you didn't know who was on drums. Uh, you didn't know who was on bass. Cause I had Cliff Williams on my podcast and he announced that he was leaving the band on my podcast. So there's always been this incredible incredible secrecy around the group which is really really tight-lipped man you know yeah they don't even talk to journalists of any kind you know oh uh if they want to keep something a secret i was their first yeah. podcast they ever did wow yeah really? that, yeah that's how crazy it is and and you know when you think about it you're just looking at it like you were really there in the era of some super secrets, one of them being Brian at that time when he's gone, did he get fired? Did he leave? That was the biggest thing ever. You know, they dropped his luggage off at his front door. Who's doing it? A cover guys auditioned and sang a whole set and then Axel's in. So that whole thing is mind boggling. And you're behind the kit during that time. What is that like? Uh, very secretive, what I say? Yeah, right. <laughs> and it was, uh, again, you knew you couldn't say that Axel was trying out, you know, if that's the right word. Right. I, I think right. it was a foregone conclusion, actually, that he was in there. And I thought he did a fantastic job, honestly. Killed it. Killed it. Yeah. He, he's not Brian. Who is Brian? And right. Brian is on Axel. But, um, when he started singing, I thought, geez, this guy can sing. I didn't know he had that voice in him. I'd only ever heard him do Guns N' Roses. Right. And uh, he came up with all these notes that only dogs can hear, you know. Yeah. And he did an amazing job, I, I thought. And he used, to, he used to warm up two hours before every show wow. and wind down one hour after. Wow. And I know that he did because I was in the next room to him. Yeah. So, oh, there goes Axel again, you know, so it must be time to get ready to go. <laughs> um, when, you're so, in, when you're there before Axel, that one guy from the cover band came in and sang like a whole set with you guys. What, that had to be bizarre, right? Yeah, it was a bit like, who have we got, guys? Um, oh, his name is Ralph and he's from Ireland or something. Oh, okay. Um, you know, uh, it was like that, and uh, a few guys were like that. I can't remember their names, to be very honest. Right. But um, I've met a few of them since, and uh, you know, they remind me of the whole thing. Right. Um, but it's uh, it they just are very secretive. Uh, they're the opposite of the Rolling Stones yeah. who are in the news all the time, you know, and ACDC, Angus particularly, is just, everything is very secretive. 
Um, and I'm, you know, a lot of bands put that they're they've got private planes or whatever, you know. To to a lot of bands, that's part of the mystique of being a rock star. Yeah. Uh, but to ACDC, they don't say they. Although all the fans knew. Of course. Uh, they don't say that they were in a private airplane, you know, uh, especially a Learjet, you know. Yeah, they, keep, they keep that blue collar thing forever, you know. You don't see yeah. Angus's houses. You don't see, uh, does he have a no. million cars or guitars? You don't see multiple properties that he has, you know. But we all know the band has made a billion dollars. But it's also yep. ki kind of refreshing to see a guy like that. And I've learned a lot from that because I think even though the fans know that you're crazy rich, they kind of appreciate you not being this fucking guy. Like, look at my watches and my cars and my island I own. You know, they they enjoy that. Yeah, I I'm, I think fans like it both ways. Actually, yeah. they you know they like people to be flash if you know if you got it, flaunt it, so to speak. But they also appreciate when somebody's private. You know, like. Paul McCartney or something like that, you know? Right. Um, and you do publicity when it's needed, when you've got a record out or something or a tour out or something like that. Um, so I can see both sides of it. And Angus is a very private person anyway. Um, and that's just the way he is. And Malcolm was the same. Um so that's the way, you know, uh, Brian and Cliff are a little more outgoing. Right. Uh, but Angus don't drink at all or do drugs. Never done drugs in his life. And he he's never drunk in his life. Um, and people go, you're, you're crazy. What are you talking about? This is AC. Yeah, well, you are. Your uh, concept of ACDC is totally different to the uh, reality of ACDC. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was, uh, I did some gigs when I was an Earth Man, did some gigs with ZZ Top, and they'd come on stage and they got a bottle of Jack and they're slugging it back, you know, in the middle of the set. And I was on a plane with, uh, with Dusty Rhodes one time. And, uh, he said to me, you know the Jack in the bottle? I said, yeah. He said, it's cold tea. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Now, okay, <laughs> another question for you. Um, of course, you, uh, you were doing the ball breaker demos, and then they come and they tell you Phil Rudd's coming back, and it's been out in the press in the last couple of weeks that they asked you to kind of ghost in case you know it doesn't work out now my yep. question on that was you said no of course out of your uh, pride and then later you were like i should have done that for the money but my my question on that was at the time why were they worried about phil did was he uh did he have a a, a problem drugs or something um I, I don't understand what that was um i think angus really likes Phil and the way he plays. Of course. But don't forget, he's the original. And, uh, you know, it's like replacing Ringo with the Beatles, you know, it's just on work. Right. Uh, so that's what gets up a lot of people's noses that other drummers, because there have been a few now, play in ACDC. And they're all they're all hung up on the other drummers saying, oh, he's not as good. He's, you know, how could he be as good? Um, so, you know, this uh, to them, it gets to be a huge thing. To me, it's just drummers doing their gig, man. Um, that's the way I see it. Um, and you're happy to get the gig. And you you do the best you possibly can. Why would you do something different? And my, my, my answer to those guys, too, is... Uh, you know, you're useless. You're a, you know, it's, I've seen that many, many times on the internet. You know, uh, you can't play properly. You know, you know, you're useless. Oh, I've played for sixty years. I think. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 
Yeah, there's there's always going to be that armchair warrior that you know works at Burger King and goes home at night and goes, Chris Slade ain't a drummer, you know, like whatever. It could be fucking. My buddy used to do a bit about it. He'd be like, uh, you know, this great comedian um, Neil Brennan. He's like, uh, Mozart, that ain't music. I know music. I'm from Florida, you know, or what? You know, some joke <laughs> like that. But you know. There's always going to be that asshole out there. And and I will tell you this, Chris, once a year I do a tribute to Bon Scott. And uh, uh-huh. and I, I have some of the biggest drummers come in. Uh, Brad Wilk from Rage Against the Machine. Uh, uh-huh. you know, S- Steve Gorman from the Black Crows. Dave Lombardo from Slayer. Uh, my man Bill Burr plays uh, the drums. And I will tell you this, I've been doing it for, you know, over 30 years or whatever. Everybody that sits behind the kit to do ACDC is like, I don't know how Phil does this. You know, it's a feel and everything. So you can't judge other drummers because it, it's just what it is with drummers. I had five of the best right now, and they're all back there with different feel and different grooves and different takes on ACDC. That's what it yep. is. Yeah, Ian Pace, who I'm a good friend of, said if the ACDC, this is on our, our show, if the ACDC gig ever came up, I wouldn't be able to do it because he's, uh, you know, he's tricky dicky, but he's, uh, he's a damn good drummer, but he could never do ACDC. He, he can't play sparse enough. Um, so really, I mean, we all, all the drummers, Listen to Angus on Mal drumming. Right. That's who the master drummers are for ACDC. Now, Phil interprets that how Phil interprets it. Um, But it's Angus and Malcolm. Um, On the demos. Right. Yes. Right at the very beginning. Right. That's how how ACDC learn their songs, demos done by Angus and Mal. Wow. And also back in the day, Bon Scott playing some drums on early yes. demos. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, Long Way to the Top. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's bagpipes in it. Oh, yeah. Right. So that's Bon's idea. Right. So uh, he says to the guys, he says, uh, you know, why don't we do something really different here? Like put... Uh, Put bagpipes on here. Oh, that's not a bad idea. Uh, let's get some bag. Uh, uh, crew, can you get some bagpipes, please? We need ba- bagpipes, bagpipes. So uh, they finally get bagpipes, and they put it down, and they go, "There you are, Bon. Bagpipes." He said, "What do you mean? There you go, Bon. I don't play bagpipes." He said, "But you were in a pipe band." He said, yes, I was a drummer in a pipe band. I can't play bagpipes. <laughs> Who played the bagpipes? I never looked into that. So all they got, I think it might have been Bon, actually. Um, they used the chanter, you know, the flute bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you blow into that because the bag puts the air into the chanter, what they call it, chanter. And um, so, and he played that. Just oh, any man. any way he could. <laughs> That's a true story. Oh, Angus told me. <laughs> That's so great, man. That's a great story. Holy shit. I'll tell you a funny story. I went to the video shoot that you guys did at the Dragonfly on the Rocket Bus Tour uh, in uh, Hollywood, that small club. And, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, was, I was there. And here's the funniest story about that. You guys ran the song about six or seven times and then you left. And when you left, I went out the side door just to say hi to Brian and and Angus and you guys, because I I had met them years ago. And as you guys were walking out, you got in a black SUV and fucking Brian was the driver. He drove. Yes. He drove you guys out of there. Yeah. Yeah. He often did that. He was often the driver and he was a good driver, too. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but I know what you mean. It wasn't a professional driver, so to speak. Right, but, right. Although he is he is professional quality driver. Right. Because he's a racing driver also. Yeah. So uh, 
yeah, I see what you mean about that. Yeah. That uh, he was doing the driving. Yeah. Um, and he used to drive us to rehearsal and all sorts of things. Wow. Um, all the time in L.A. I remember him driving. And probably other places, too. It's just accepted that Brian would be the driver. That's fucking uh, didn't amazing. Even, didn't even think of it before you said that, but I can see exactly what you mean. You know, there's no chauffeur out front. No, it's so <laughs> wild. I always wondered if he got a cut for uh, being the driver also. <laughs> he used to driver money and, also. and he used to make sandwiches on the side too, you know. So he probably got a cut for that. Yeah. Oh, my God. Actually, his, his brother was the, the chef on the tour. Wow, no shit? Yeah. God. So Brian's brother was the chef, yeah. And he was good too. Let's talk about Let the Be Rock. It's usually 13 to 14 minutes live. How taxing was that on you at this uh, era of the rocker bust, you know, being oh. later in your life? Raining. Absolutely. We were all, everybody was like a, a a limp, wet rag. Right. Coming off there. And I often got, um, at that point, I'd sit down and I'd get cramp in my hand or something, which is, Drummers will tell you it's really painful and you can't stop it, you know. Um, so, you know, that uh, drained is the only word I can think of at the end of that. Um, I was really proud of it, though. Uh, I look at live at Donington and see my hi-hat at the end of that. And it's like, how the hell did you do that, Slaves? <laughs> Honestly, I, I question myself. I've always been pretty fast on things like that. I've always had fast hands. Um, not so fast these days, but uh, I always used to. Um, but I looked at that and it's like, geez, that's me, isn't it, playing? Wow. And uh, honestly, and you know, there's a story there. Um, oh, I'm thinking of the names and me and names is just yeah. Um uh Gordon Bennett. I keep getting Axel, but it's not Axel. Um, <laughs> um Metallica. Oh yeah. Lars. Lars Ulrich, yeah. Yep. I could... <laughs> and uh Tommy Lee. Oh yeah. Um I didn't know this, but all through that song, the hi-hat going at like 20,000 miles an hour, which it seems like. Um, I used to take a slight break. So we're going diddle little 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 And at some point, I would take a little break. The break was, I'd go, did it, did it, did it. Da, 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 da. Um, and that's what I would do. That's my break. Wow. It wasn't really a break. Right. Um, and I did it out of fear, really, that I would have to stop playing or something. Um, and they used to place bets. You can ask either of them. Um, uh, they used to place bets with each other when I was going to take that break. They'd swallow my hi hat. <laughs> oh my God, it's <laughs> funny. <laughs> like Slade's going to uh, break right here. Yeah, like, okay, the, the 15th minute, okay, the third minute, okay, the 25th minute, whatever it was. Wow. But, uh, you know, on that album, on Donington, it's about 15, 20 minutes long, something like that. But in reality, when we played, it was about 25 minutes long. Jesus. Um, And there was Mal going, drag, 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 incessantly. He was a genius, God. best rhythm player I've ever worked with. He's unbelievable, dude. He is unbelievable. You know, yeah, when you he, just see him back there, you know, he's like a metronome, you know, and quick and, oh, too. Oh, unbelievable! Yeah, unbelievable. And the drive that comes from him, you yeah. know, that used to come from him. I'm sorry, um, is unbelievable. Um, you know, well, I say to. I say to the detractors with the drumming thing, I'll go back to that in a second. And I say, oh, so what you're saying is Angus and Mal are really stupid because they hired me 
right? Is that's what you're saying, really? That they're not competent to judge uh, what a good drummer is or not. Yeah, and you're right. uh, is that what you're saying? And <laughs> you know, and they go, Ugh. yeah. yeah. And, you're calling your leave. favorite band dummies. That's what you're saying, huh? <laughs> dummies, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. nuts. Everybody, you know, you got these idiots. They're like, after Bond, no more. And I'm like, really, really, you're going to not. Uh, you're going to deny the genius of Back in Black for those about to rock and Flick of the Switch. You're going to deny those three, the vocal power that comes off those records as some of the most violent singing I've ever heard. And I'm a Bon Scott guy. I got them tattooed on my side. I do a tribute really? to them every year. Oh, yeah. But I'll tell you what right now. Brian, on those three records is so goddamn mind boggling that every time I hear it, the scream on the beginning of those about to rock, unbelievable. The, the, the vocal on have a drink on me, this shit is insane. So yeah, there's yeah. always those fucking people out there. Always. It doesn't matter. And in the meantime, ACDC is bigger than ever. Yeah, they certainly are. Today, they are. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, they're denying themselves the pleasure of enjoying music. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well, they're, of they're, all they're, kinds. You know, yeah. they're the ones that, oh, I, I, I can't play any, uh, any Metallica. I only play ACDC. Yeah. Oh, I don't listen you know, to Prince. That's dumb. Miles <laughs> Davis. No way. Rock only. And you're like, get out of here, you tumbleweed. You know? <laughs> Now here, yeah. well, let me let me get into an honest question with you, Chris. Um, of course, the tour happens; they get the new drummer and and Cheney on bass. Do you believe that they were looking at a long tour? This Europe tour is ridiculous. It's a it's a grueler, and then obviously there's going to be an American tour. There's no way there's not. You talking about Let There Be Rock and me talking to Cliff Williams going, I just physically can't really do it anymore. Do you think that they're like, in order to do the next two years, let's get a younger rhythm section? Um, I never thought of it, to be honest. Uh, no, I don't think it's that. Um, Angus wants the band a certain way. Right. And he'll do whatever he wants to get that thing, whatever it is in his head. Um, uh, you know, I've done it for a few years, but obviously he wants somebody else doing it. Right. Um, you have to ask him why I'm not there. Uh, I used to know Matt Log, by the way, uh, when I lived in California. I knew Matt. Uh, because he used to play with some friends of mine right. uh, in the pub on a Friday if he wasn't working, as they all did, um, in Manhattan Beach. Oh, wow. And it, was a, it was a great band, and uh, Matt used to sit in sometimes. Uh, Todd Sukum was the drummer, uh, who was often there, who's the guy who plays with uh, the band Sticks. Oh, yeah. Um, and he's a great, great player. Todd. And so is Matt, by the way. Yeah. Uh, he played on Alanis Morissette. Of course. Jagged Little Pill. Um, yeah. Um, so I don't know. You see, I'm not sure if Phil can get into the States. Right. I'm, I don't know. I really don't know. I'm just surmising. Right. Because of all his problems, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think they'd use Matt if they were doing a an American tour. Right. But I may be completely wrong. You, you know, never know. Angus, is, Angus is Angus. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's a law unto himself. He yeah. really is. He just does what he wants to do, and that's. And why shouldn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been there a hundred years, you know, and yeah. uh, yeah. and we get it. Listen, I got to tell you, it was an honor to talk to you. Congrats on your solo record coming out here. Uh, Chris Slade's Timeline, Time yeah. Escape. 
and I listened to it. Man, the singer sounds like Udo Dirk Snyder to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's got a little bit of cool Udo thing. I like it. Oh well, I'll tell him. Yeah, uh, we got two. We got two singers. Oh wow! Uh, the the ACDC guy is Bon Davis. Uh huh. And uh, the other guy is uh, Stevie G. He also plays bass in the band. Wow. Um, so, uh, you know, he, he does the Man From Man's Earth band stuff, uh, Uriah Heep, the uh, David Gilmore, um, and all points, uh, you know, other stuff. Um, so the, but, tour uh, is, uh, the tour is your entire uh, anthology, your career, song-wise. Yep. And, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, that's what I thought. You know, I, I thought timeline. I thought that was a good idea for it. Great. Um, I was thinking time machine, but uh, timeline. Oh, yeah, that's great. Out. And um, we've been together for 12 years. We're still touring together, you know, in a van, as I explained. Uh -huh. um, and we we go all over Europe and Eastern Europe too. We were in Poland three months ago. Wow. Uh, Chechnya just uh, this year. Um, and where else? We go, to, uh, we go to Italy in two weeks time. Uh, Germany after that. Did I say last Saturday, we were in Lyon, France doing a tour. So we're always working and always have been working except for COVID. Of course, and this little known band called ACDC, something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. A, B, A, B C, D. Uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, uh, we get on well together. We know each other. We're a really good band live. Everybody says that, but we're a really good band live. In fact, it's uh, people are uh, overawed. To be honest, yeah, because James James Comford is a fantastic guitarist, and uh, we are sometimes, most times, we do comfortably numb. Now he's not David Gilmore, who is David Gilmore, right, of course, but he does uh, a tremendous job soloing. And if you've heard the album, you've heard him on the end of uh, the end of eternity, the last track. Um. And and that's him well in the way, man. So he's uh, great. Does he play that Eddie Van Halen guitar? He plays all sorts of different. A striped he, one. He, he bought. Yes, he's got one of those. I he, saw it. He bought a, two guitars yesterday when he was on the train. Oh my God! <laughs> really? <laughs> so uh, you know he's uh, he's got a lot of guitars, as more a lot of guitarists. Do have, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, James and Mike Clark, the uh, the keyboard player, we all sing, especially back in vocals, but we all do uh, lead vocals too. Yeah. Um, a, uh, oh, lost my track there. Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you, it, it was uh, it was an honor to talk oh, to you. Oh, I know it. I know. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'll, yeah. get, I'll say this. They've been playing together since they were 11 years old, and they're 35 now. So, you know, it's a really, they are a really tight unit, James and Mike. And James also plays second guitar on the ACDC stuff. So I didn't know he could play guitar when I asked him to join the band. <laughs> wow. He's only he doing said, oh. Malcolm. I started, you know, I started on ACDC. Yeah. Oh, he knows all about Malcolm, you know. Yeah, I've 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 bored him with it so many times, you know. <laughs> well, thanks for doing the show, Chris. Great to have you. And, very welcome. Uh, Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And congrats on having just an incredible career so far, man. I mean, it's just been like you've played with the gods: Gary Moore, David Gilmore, Jimmy Page. And fucking, of course, Angus Young and Malcolm. I mean, it's just mind-boggling who you've played with and the records that you've been on. 
and your uh, your career has just been a, a dream for most drummers. Ninety nine percent of the drummers would dream to have your your career. And so thank well, you. Thank you. And I hope to uh, meet you one day in the States or something. Yeah. And, where, and where do you want? I'm in California, Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I used to live in California. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, thank you. There's a, the song on the album, about third song, I think, is called Living the Dream. Yeah. And uh, it's about self-belief. And you got to have that if you're in this business. It's all because... I it's all I preach, buddy. It's all I preach. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because if you if you stop on the first person that says no to you, you'll never get anywhere. You have to be able to have punches to the face most of your life. You know, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Like we we're talking about the drummer, the trolls, the drumming trolls. Oh yeah, yeah. You um, know what, dude? You know, somebody told me recently. They're like, "Don't read the comments," and it's hard. And 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 no matter how fucking much success you have, I think it's more mind-boggling the amount of evil someone can just sit home on their computer and sling. Yeah. And 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 you know. What you know, I'll tell you this, Chris, right now, about once every four or five days, I'll get an email and somebody will say your comedy or your podcast has got me through some bad times. I cannot thank you enough. And man, when they do that, they have no idea where I'm at mentally uh, in my life. Uh, you know, I could be down that day and get that email and be like, yeah. Yeah, man, these yeah, people right. are, these people are digging it out there, and you get that's a that's a blast of keep going, you know. Definitely, yeah, I get the same. You know, I started playing drums because of you. Yeah, you know, it, uh, I get it all the time, and I'm really proud of that. Yeah, I, yeah. I set somebody up as a, a drummer, you know, and he's still going. It's no great. matter what level, it don't matter what level. Yeah, but I kicked him off. Right. As Buddy Rich kicked me off, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, that feels so good. So in between the evil that comes, you get these sprinkles of, uh, you know, just incredible kindness. And then it's like, oh, yeah, okay, there we go, man. You know, like when I walk down the street, sometimes somebody will recognize me in the way, Dean Del Rey, and I'll be like, oh, I'm not, I'm not happy, like, ooh, I'm famous or something. I'm like, oh, God, I made that guy's. Uh, day somehow, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's where it's that's at. A great, that's a great thought. Yes, I'll tell you uh, what. Buddy. That is where it's at. That's what we're all doing this for, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, that keep, is the motivation. Keep the candles lit, my man, and uh, thank you so much for doing the show. And thank uh, you very much for have the a, invitation. Oh god, yeah. Have a great week and come back anytime, man. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. I'll see you bye later, Chris. Now. All right. Bye-bye. See you, bud.